Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Li Hui Zhang, and uh, I'm an assistant professor here at uh, uh, JSGS. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lars Osberg to you today. Dr. Osberg is McCullough Professor and Chair of the Department of Economics at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He attended Queen's University and the London School of Economics and Political Science as an undergraduate. After two years working for the Tanzania CISO Corporation as a CUSO volunteer, he went to York University, uh, sorry, Yale University for his PhD. Uh, he has had visiting positions at a number of universities, including Cambridge, New York University. Most recently, during 2009 to 2010, he was Senior Visiting Research Fellow at Research on Poverty Alleviation, uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and Visiting Scholar at the Indira Gandhi Institute for Development Research in Mumbai, India. Dr. Osberg has authored numerous books articles, chapters, reviews, and reports on the extent and causes of poverty and economic inequality with particular emphasis on social policy. Among other professional responsibilities, he was president of the Canadian Economics Association in 1999 to 2000. As some of you may already know, I'm fortunate enough to have Dr. Osberg as one of my two PhD co-supervisors. Those years have been instrumental for my personal growth. Not only did Dr. Osberg teach me economics, but also he exemplified to me some of the most respected qualities as a teacher and as a scholar. Please allow me to take this opportunity and say that I'm deeply grateful for his kindness and his mentorship. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Osberg to Saskatchewan. Uh, thank you, Li Wei, for those very kind words and uh, introduction. Uh, it, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here uh, in, in Regina uh, and to be, be talking uh, about what is, I think, a, a hugely important uh, topic uh, for our society and, and for, the, for, the, for, the, for the global society. Um, what I'll be talking about, you can see the title, Instability Implications of Increasing Inequality, Evidence uh, from North America. Um, this, this paper was initially a, a conference uh, a paper a couple of years ago, uh, and it's gone through a couple of uh, working paper versions. Uh, if you're interested later on, the, the paper's available, I understand, on the website here, and will be available on my own web, uh, website. If you're willing to, to, to wait long enough, it'll actually come out as a journal article in economic modeling, uh, in, whenever journal articles come out, which is intends to be later. Uh, and, the basic uh, point I want to uh, address, well, I guess we ought to always ought to allow a little bit of time for people who arrive, to arrive late and have the first few slides should perhaps have a little bit of motivational force. So, let, okay, now I'm going to, there we go. Um, the World Economic Forum, their analysis of fa global risks uh, facing the world, uh, not much more uh, elite opinion do you get the than that of the, the sort of the power elite of uh, the, the global economy. What did they rank as their top five risks in terms of likelihood? Uh, severe income disparity and chronic fiscal imbalances. What did they rank as, as among their top five risks in 2012? Uh, major systemic financial failure, chronic fiscal imbalances, extreme volatility, i.e. call it in economic instability. Uh, so, at the level of elite opinion and also at the level of grassroots opinion, uh, a February 2012 a survey of Canadians, roughly 3,000 by ECOS, asked them which do you think is the biggest threat uh, to the global economy. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, people chose uh, the responses that the things that really, the dangers really facing the, 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 the global economy are about, all about both the uh, growing debt crisis in an advanced economy and the increasing concentration of, of income and wealth uh, in, in advanced economies. And so I, I want to try and argue to you to, today uh, that these are very much linked issues. 
that they're inherently linked issues. Uh, that, and, and it's always been a, a good practice to have your entire lecture in, in one slide at some point. And so my entire uh, uh, roadmap uh, for, for what I'm about to say is basically going to be based around the idea that in the US and Canada, we've seen, well, call it one way or call it the other, it's really the same phenomenon. If different parts of the income distribution grow at different rates, that means inherently that the distribution of income must change, inequality must change. That's both unbalanced growth and in changing inequality. So unbalanced growth, the flip side of unbalanced growth is changing inequality, it just has to be. Uh, so which way do we want to think about it? Uh, whatever way we want to think about unbalanced growth or changing inequality, this is not a trend that can continue indefinitely into, into the indefinite future. It cannot be a steady state equilibrium uh, of a market economy. Uh, so when, one of the reasons why we're worried about uh, increasing inequality uh, is because it's a story whose end we don't know. It, it's, it's got to be going somewhere but we don't exactly know how this story ends. Now, there was a point in time, back when I st first started uh, thinking about uh, income distribution and inequality, uh, when the study of income inequality was denigrated as being about as interesting as watching grass grow. Uh, because for a long period of time, uh, from the late 40s to the middle 70s, there just wasn't much change in the quintile shares or decile shares of, uh, of income in countries like Canada, the US, and, and the UK. And so that if the income distribution is pretty much stable, uh, there's not much go going on, that's what you call balanced growth. If there's balanced growth at all different parts of the income distribution, and the in distribution of income um, therefore remains stable over time, uh, then that's a, a reason why macroeconomic theorists can s start to say, well, we can ignore the income distribution. We can think, think in terms of this balanced growth, uh, of steady state growth. We can think in terms of representative agents. But that's not the world of today. That's not the world of today and hasn't been the world uh, that we've experienced for about the last 25 years. So what we have observed instead is very unequal rates of growth at, very, at, at different parts of the income distribution and therefore the changing cross-sectional distribution of income. And my argument is that this creates inherently interacting instabilities, that it creates inherently uh, debt fragilities and, and the hangovers from debt fragilities in, ter in terms of uh, financial crises and their aftermaths. And I'd like, and the, and the question is, is there something in the economic system that's an automatic stabilizer? One thing that, one thing, in fact, the only thing that will stabilize the distribution of income uh, in a cross-sectional sense is if all parts of the income distribution start to grow at the same rate. This can happen either because the top end grows more slowly or the bottom end grows more quickly, but what exactly is the economic process that's likely to produce either of those outcomes? I don't actually see any particular automatic economic tendency for the rates of growth of different parts of the income distribution uh, to equalize. And so that implies that, we're going to, that we have to be thinking that market mechanisms have at least the possible potential of being inherently unstable or great generating interacting instabilities going forward. Now that's the sort of picture we observe from Canada and the United States. But the picture you think of, you can see from the, from the Mexican perspective is quite different. It, Mexico is a country starting at a different stage of economic development. At a different stage of economic development, you still have room for many structural sort of one-off kind of, cha of changes, uh, such as ur urbanization, such as increasing female labor for participation, such as uh, an expanding role for education. So those changes can produce and do produce substantial growth of income that incomes at the bottom. When you combine that with the political economy of social policies and a, and a credible threat uh, from, from the hard left, you see uh, the establishment of significant social programs in the Mexican context. So a very different pattern of income distributional change in, 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 in Mexico. So the question I'm going to be ending up with is, if 
economic mechanisms can't stabilize growth rates in countries like Canada and the US, can we depend on political economy in some sense to stabilize uh, growth rates, to return us to a balanced growth rate path, and to stabilize uh, the distribution of income? And I should say, say that at this point uh, that, that some things won't be in this talk. Uh, there's, there's been an enormous amount of re research uh, on the uh, distribution of income. Uh, on the left, you, you see a whole bunch of acronyms, LIS, Luxembourg Income Study, ISSP, International Social Survey Program, WVS, World Value Survey, OECD, that's a, a huge uh, database, uh, World Development Indicators, that's from the World Bank. Uh, those are all examples of the just explosion of comparable international data sets uh, that enable social sciences researchers for the last 15, 20 years uh, to compare nations in terms of their level of poverty and inequality and a whole bunch of other social indicators. Um, so there have been many, many cross-sectional, uh, cross-country comparisons at points in time uh, of the level of, any, of economic inequality and its implications for health, for happiness, for crime, for democracy, for economic growth. Then the thing about those uh, the, that, that literature is it's always been cross-sectional comparisons, which kind of assumes that those cross-sectional levels are going to be stable over time, right? I, I want to focus rather on changing levels of inequality within countries over a particular, over particular countries. The un unbalanced growth within countries, not cross-sectional comparisons of levels. Now, and on the right panel, uh, that refers to another but huge body of literature, which I won't be uh, talking about today, uh, which uh, is based similarly on, on the expanding tools of, of, of labor economists, pr primarily, uh, in the e enormous increase in data sets uh, that, uh, that survey the population, the initially cross-sectional, more recently panel data sets, uh, which uh, have pretty good answers on a whole bunch of questions regarding what's happening with what I would call the middle 90% of the population. The sample surveys, by their, by their nature, uh, pick up lots more people in the middle 90% of the population than they do in the top 1% tail at the bottom or at the top. Uh, and so the many labor economists uh, have spent a lot of time worrying about the impact of things like minimum wages, unions, other institutional changes, uh, changing female labor force participations, uh, homogamy, which is a fancy word for saying that uh, like marry like or, or not, uh, changing returns to education, changing union density, skill bias and technological change, impacts of demography, all those things, globalization, did I forget globalization? A lot of work has been done on impacts on either hourly wages or annual earnings or, or, or whatever for that middle 90% of the district. And I'm, that's very often useful as a way of understanding how people have changed their position in the distribution uh, of, of, of income. Uh, there's been a lot of churning, lots of structural change in, in the labor markets. But I'm going to ignore that for, for the basic reason that the, in the end, those changes don't add up to nearly as much. Because we've seen in, in the change of the top, uh, we've seen a 10 percentage point change in the share of the top 1% of the income distribution in the United States, and nearly as big in, in Canada. Now that is huge. When, when the bottom 20% of the income distribution get of the order of 4% uh, of, of, the, of, of, of household income, uh, the top 1% have changed their share by two and a half times the total receipts of the bottom 20%. When we talk about the, share, the changing shares of the intermediate quintiles of the income distribution, we're talking about, you know, percentage point here, percentage point there, half a percentage point, that sort of thing. Nothing like as big, an order of magnitude smaller uh, than what's been happening at the extreme top end. So what I'm going to be primarily talking about uh, uh, focuses on the new, new availability over the last 10, 15 years maybe, uh, of, of uh, returns based on income tax data and a complete census.
what's happening at the very top. So my basic argument is that unbalanced growth and increasing inequality are flip sides of exactly the same coin. That what we've seen uh, over the period 1987 to 2007, uh, which is a useful period to, to look at because uh, after 1988, Canada and the US, uh, Canadian professionals could move more, more easily to the US under the free trade agreement. Uh, 2007 was the, was the last year before the, uh, before the financial crisis, so we're kind of comparing peak to peak in, in the business cycle. Um, on, you can summarize that period as saying that the incomes of the top 1% of the distribution grew at like 4% per year compounded, and the bottom 80% of the distribution grew at like a half a percentage point a year uh, compounding. Uh, and there was some little bit of an improvement as you went into the 90th, 95th, 96th uh, per percentiles of the distribution, but you're not going far wrong if you think basically about top 1% as having a very different income trajectory from the other 99%. Now, as I've already said, Mexico since 1995 is a very different story with structural changes plus social transfers. Uh, and I'm going to argue that in many ways what they've been going through uh, since 1995 is not so very different from the same sort of structural changes that Canada and the U.S. experienced uh, in the post-war period. Now, in the post-war period in Canada, the US, and the UK, uh, when income distribution was stable and people could uh, think that income distribution uh, wasn't something that you had to worry about because it just wasn't changing all that much. So economists uh, didn't have to worry anymore about those old ideas of class conflict and the inherent instability of capitalism that had preoccupied economists uh, for the period all, all the way through from the 1800s through the 1930s, uh, econ economics started kind of as a profession kind of changed its orientation and started focusing much more on, on steady state e equilibrium as an inherent characteristic uh, of, of a market system. Uh, but if we have unbalanced growth, then all those bets are off. I'd argue that the, that the period uh, up to about 1970, Five was kind of a happy accident, uh, where you had a special case of balanced growth, uh, a steady state equilibrium, because it happened to be the case that all parts of the income distribution grew at, uh, at approximately the same rate. And that a very important part, component of that stability of the income distribution were the structural reforms instituted in the US uh, in the 1930s as a response to the instability of the Great, Great Depression. Now, if we're going to talk about US, Canada, and Mexico, how different are we? Well, we know right off the start, the different in population size, different in GDP per, per capita. But the differences I, I'm going to focus on, well, tertiary level education, ages 25 to 64, uh, much higher, of course, at the bottom edge of that range, at the 25 level than at the 64 level. But Canada and the U.S. already well-educated populations, very well-educated populations, uh, in, uh, in 2009. Not much hope for further improvement from there. Mexico, very different case. Uh, female labor force participation, Canada and the U.S., already very high rates of labor for female labor force participation. Uh, Mexico, much, much lower. Still room for imp improvement. Uh, agriculture, again, still a much larger fraction of the population uh, in Mexico than in Canada uh, or the US. Not much room for uh, migration out of, out of rural poverty to, to affect the distribution of income in Canada or the US any, anymore. That, 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 that train has left the station, that's gone. Uh, and people here don't quite really appreciate typically, but a large change in demography has happened in Mexico as in many other Latin American na nations where the birth rate has essentially halved uh, over the last 25 years. 
So you have a really structurally huge change in demography. Birth rates were already low in Canada in 1980. Not a whole lot of room to change. So we're different, and we're partly different because of the structural point in the development process. Now, there we go. So what's been happening in Canada and, and the US? Well, typically people look for the Gini index as a summary measure of, of income distribution. Uh, a good way to think of it is to look at the, the, equi uh, the equivalized after tax, after transfer uh, uh, distribution among individuals uh, of household income. And what, what you observe there are th three very different kinds of trends. In, in Canada, uh, the least inequality of the bottom line, uh, you, you see a, a, a trend which kind of stable for the, from the mid 80s to the mid 90s. Uh, this was a period uh, when rising market income inequality was largely offset by the tax and transfer system. Uh, but after 1995, a steady increase in, uh, in, uh, in the, it's the Gini index of inequality of, of household income. The U.S. is, is a solid line in, in, the, in the chart. Uh, pretty steady creep upward in total Gini index uh, of, of uh, income inequality. Mexico, a different case, much higher inequality to start, rising to 1995, but then descending thereafter. Uh, and that, that trend is characteristic of much, many Latin American countries. It's not just Mexico. Think about a Gini index of inequality. Think about any uh, summary index uh, of inequality is that it doesn't tell you which part of the income distribution is changing. The, a lot, most of the income distribution can remain exactly the same, but the Gini index won't tell you which part is changing. So that's why I think it's useful to look at what's been happening to the real income of Canadian households at different percentile points in the income distribution. Uh, this, uh, this table, uh, this figure looks at the 20th, 40th, 50th, 60th, and 80th percentile of the distribution of income. Uh, that is to say, uh, so. And what's noticeable to me, that, that faint line down at the bottom uh, is the 20th percentile of the income distribution. Next to it, the dashed line is the 40th, and the solid line is the median. What's noticeable to me is about that is that here we've got a 76 to 2009, 33-year period. Just not much of anything is happening. You get a bit more, a bit of upward movement at the 60th, and then when you get up to the 80th percentile, there's a bit of an upward trend, particularly over the last little uh, part of the, of the period, over the 2000s. Uh, but we have a 33-year period in Canada in which most points in the income distribution just didn't see much action at all in real income. And of course, whether, whether uh, Households in the middle part of the income distribution are supplying significantly more hours to the paid labor market over this period. So, so in, if anything, overstates uh, their, their their trend in real well-being. It's, it's it's the whole batch. It's uh, dis disposable household income, uh, market income uh, minus taxes plus transfers. Uh, it, now, if you, if you, if you go by, uh, to, uh, um, say, market hourly wages, uh, for example, uh, flat, flat, flat from 1980 on, strong growth in the late 1970s, um, but uh, flat from about 1980, 81. Uh, so uh, it's not surprising that you're going to find, uh, so median or average hourly wages, same basic trend. And uh, if, you, if you draw like a, a, a plot uh, of the distribution of, of hourly wages in 1980 and the distribution of hourly wages in 2005, they, they overlap almost exactly. So there's a lot of churning going on, uh, individuals moving up, individuals moving down, but the distribution remaining remarkably 
the same. U.S. Uh, in the in the U.S., they're less shy about reporting the income of the 95th percentile. Like Canadian Statistics Canada is very shy about doing that high in the income distribution. Uh, so you can actually see in the in the orange line at the top uh, the growth at the 95th percentile of the income distribution, and below it you can see the corresponding 80th, 60th, median, uh, 40th, and 20th percentiles of the income distribution. And again, the, the farther down you go in the distribution, uh, the greater the stagnancy. Uh, in, in real dollar terms, uh, the stability of the income of the person at the household at the 20th percentile of the distribution is just quite traumatic. Uh, so what this is, is telling us is that those changes in the distribution of, of income that are summarized in the Gini index are not coming from real income changes that are happening at the 20th, 40th, 50th, 60th, or 80th percentile of the income distribution. They're coming from changes that are happening at the top end of the income distribution. And in particular, what's been happening to the top 1% of, of the income now, this, uh, I have to thank um, uh, Mike Veal of McMaster for, for sharing his, his, his data with me. Uh, there, there's also uh, now a uh, database available on the, on the web, the World Top Incomes Database, where you can download this stuff from many, many countries uh, in, any time you want. Many people are now familiar with this, uh, this idea that the top 1% share uh, was very high in the 1920s uh, plummeted uh, in the 1930s and, and, and the, as, as the, both Canada and the U.S. went into the Second World War uh, and, and declined slowly until the 1970s and started to increase uh, dramatically uh, in the 1980s. Now the red line, dotted lines are, are, are Canada's uh, top 1% income share and it should be cautioned uh, that this is tax unit data so it's sensitive to how top end incomes are treated for tax purposes. Uh, in the U.S., it, closely held corporations of the top one percent do get uh, attributed back to their to their or to their owners. In Canada, that hasn't been the case. So we're talking about individual income tax returns, uh, of the top one percent of individual income tax returns. So we're not able yet to count what's been ha what's happening to the closely held corporations of that top one percent. There's a research project underway. I feel it's a, associated with it to, to uh, try and figure, to decode that. So it may, may or may not be the case that, that the Canadian top 1% share is less than the American top 1% share. Now, this is, is taken from uh, uh, Mike Field's uh, presidential address. It's lifted uh, straight from his uh, his uh, presidential address that was published in the Canadian uh, Journal of Economics uh, and takes it a little bit more up to date. You can see uh, the, the, uh, both the, period, the run up from 1987 to uh, in the 1980s, rather than extreme right, you can see the run up in top 1% share uh, and then the, the, the decline uh, with corresponding to the, uh, the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, and then but the bottom two lines are for the, the share of the top one tenth of one percent and the top one one hundredth of one percent, uh, and you can you can see that uh, that there the top one tenth of one percent uh, and the top one hundredth of one percent seem to be starting to recover very nicely uh, from the temporary shock of, of the Great Recession, uh, and so they're back on uh, the previous uh, tra trajectory. So. Now, one th thing I want to just remind everybody is that, that an income share is actually a ratio. Uh, the income share of the top 1% is the average income of, of the, the total incomes of the top 1% uh, divided by the total incomes of everybody, which is the incomes of the other 99% plus their incomes, right? And a change in a ratio uh, is always a tricky thing to interpret because it can, a ratio 
uh, can go up either because the numerator goes up or because the denominator goes down. Uh, and the ratio can change over time because either the numerator grows faster or because the denominator grow, grows slower. Uh, so if we're thinking about changing income shares, uh, we might want to ask the question, uh, where has the action actually been uh, in income shares? Is it uh, the, the changing uh, numerator uh, that's, that's driving these trends or is it the changing denominator uh, that's uh, driving trends. And the next slide is actually lifted uh, from uh, a, a, a paper by Saez and Piketty in a, in a book by Atkinson uh, and, and, and Piketty. For some unaccountable reason, they just buried this way in the appendix. Uh, but I think it's their most interesting uh, chart out there because it uh, presents the, the real income of the bottom 99% and the top 1% of the U.S. from like the 1917 up to, to, to 2000 and, and something. And on the, on the left hand uh, side, uh, you, and, and, the, and, the, the, and the, with the top, the, the dark top line, uh, is the average income of, of the bottom uh, uh, 99%. And on the right hand side uh, is the scale for the average income, average real income of, of the top 1%. Uh, and so, what, you, what you'll notice is that they're, they're kind of moving together uh, for the period uh, up to about uh, 1940, when the U.S. Is, uh, gets involved in the second, 40-41, when the U.S. gets involved in the Second World War. And then the top line just scoots up, right? Uh, and that's, a rep, that, that's the average incomes, average real incomes of the bottom 99%. Now, the average real incomes of the top 1% aren't declining. In fact, they've got a very modest upward trend to them throughout this, this period. Now, if we flip back, we can see that that's exactly the period when their income share fell and fell precipitously. But their income share, the income share of the top 1% didn't fall because the top 1% were in any sense absolutely worse off, it's because everybody else was much better off and growing much more rapidly. Income shares, changing income shares, are all about relative rates of growth at different parts of the income distribution. So you can see how the top, the top line just trucks on up uh, until the 1970s and then stabilizes, has a little bit of a, a downward Trend, but it's essentially it's fluctuating around a fairly flat trend from the 1970s on. Whereas the, the bottom line, which is the real incomes of the top 1%, is increasing over, over time and then in the 1980s really starts to scoot upwards. So that's what, what I mean by saying that it's the relative rates of growth of different parts of the income distribution that really drive changing income shares. And you can see that here's the US and, and Canada making the same point uh, that the real incomes of the top 1% didn't fall really much of ever, except for very brief periods of time. They just grew slowly until the early 1980s, or the mid 1980s. And it's those unequal relative growth rates that cause changing income shares. And the thing is that, that when you look at, well, let's go back here, here. You look at this sort of figure, you, you might get the impression, well, income inequality was high back in the 1920s, it fell, and now we're coming back to a high inequality. It's kind of like, used to be one steady state, then we get to another, uh, period of low inequality, now we're going back to another uh, steady state. So you might get the impression that, you know, we're at least going to stabilize at, at, uh, at, at some high level of inequality. But this, the rising real incomes of the top 1%, there's no particular reason why that process has to stop. There's, there's no particular reason why it 
can't keep on, uh, on trucking. And in fact, well, here is another way of summarizing the same data, just looking at it in terms of growth rates at different parts of the distribution, should caution you that the bottom uh, percentiles, or the 20th, 40th to, to the 80th percentile are household income data drawn from uh, surveys, the, the top uh, 99th, 99.9, percentiles of income distribution uh, numbers are drawn from the, uh, the tax data. So they're not quite, their growth rates are comparable. The, the underlying concept is a little bit differently measured. Um, and key thing to, to recognize when you look at those high annual growth rates at the very top end of the income distribution is that you've got income growth 4 or 5% per year compounding year after year after year on what was initially a very high base. So uh, if you think of uh, if the, the world top income database enables you to look at what the real income of the top one tenth one percent of the U.S. was in like 2005, 2006, 2007, it's going up by like from 6.8 million to 7.3 million to uh, 7.9 million, approximately a $500,000 annual increase each and every year, right? And Continue increasing. So that makes a big impact on per capita GDP. If you take the median Canadian household with the income of about seventy thousand a year and a, and a, and a long term average growth rate of around zero point four percent per annum, that's about two hundred eighty bucks a year uh, increase in, in GDP. Somebody with a million bucks growing at 4% a year, that's uh, adding like 40,000 a year to, to, to GDP. So it's not surprising that you can have robust uh, GDP per capita growth if it's all concentrated on high incomes that are compounding up at a, at a high, uh, high rate. So in that sense, GDP per capita growth rates in Canada and the U.S., have simply been a highly misleading average of stagnancy for the vast majority of the population and very high compound rates of growth at the very top. Okay, so what are the implications of all this? Now, well, well let's, go, let's go back here just for a minute. If we were to stabilize income uh, inequality, the only way in which in income inequality can be stabilized is if all those growth rates of income at different parts of the distribution were the same. The only way in which the income distribution can be stable over time is if they're all, all parts of the uh, incomes at all parts of the distribution are growing at the same rate. Now, if that rate on average is like 2% uh, per year or 3% per year, the two, two questions uh, might ask you, so you might ask yourself, what is it that would pull the bottom 95% of the distribution up to a compound annual growth rate of like 3% per annum year after year? Or alternatively, you could stabilize by reducing the growth rates of the people at the very top that too would stabilize the income distribution. So what process might actually reduce the growth rates of income at the very top of the distribution? Absent either an increase at the bottom in growth rates or a decrease at the top in growth rates, the inequality in growth rates will necessarily mean increasing inequality off into the indefinite future. So what does that imply? Well. We're talking about a big difference in growth rates compounded year over year. 4% for the top 1%, a half a percentage point for, for the bottom 80%. What are the, can we think of any structural changes in the immediate horizon that would suddenly boost the growth rates of the bottom 80% of the population to a 4% level? We're still talking about 
continuing high unemployment uh, in, in the US, continuing high youth unemployment, over 7% unemployment in Canada. Unions are weak, uh, institutional protections for labor are, are very poor. Uh, low wage employment is highly exposed to international uh, competition. Structural change, well, we've already had urbanization and f increasing female labor force participation. Everybody's talking about the importance of education, but we're really talking about marginal changes, marginal improvements from a very well-educated stock of, uh, already, right? So we're only talking about increasing in tertiary education for the margin uh, of, and the margin of expansion is from a, a, a level at which the majority of the 18 to 24 cohort are already in post-secondary education. So, We've had our structural changes. Now, why would income growth at the top slow? Well, is there, there are many explanations of, uh, competing explanations of what's been going on at the top end. The top end. Uh, increasing uh, in prevalence of winner-take-all markets, increasing control of, uh, by, uh, by the CEOs and top executives over the executive compensation process. Uh, many competing explanations, none of them have any particular reason to, s to slow down. I mean, if the top CEOs have been able to appropriate most of the gains from growth uh, for the last 20 years, why exactly would they stop? Uh, if, if it's uh, returns uh, to, to rents, to, con to the, the, re the trademark rents of the, of the Nike swoosh or the Apple computer, which are being marketed to, now to the world, those trademark rent, those rents grow with the growth of the international marketplace. Uh, so why exactly would we expect the, a, de a sudden deceleration and a dramatic deceleration in the income growth rates pre-tax of, of the top 1% of the, of the population? But if it continues, we have to face some important issues of accounting. I mean, that's one of the great things about economics, that things do have to add up. We have these accounting identities out there. And so there are general equilibrium effects. Increased income has to be either consumed or saved. Uh, there's been a lot of attention uh, paid, and, and appropriately so, uh, to the, the monster homes and the excess of uh, ostentatious consumption uh, of, of, the, of the top 1%. One, 1%. But at least that does recycle income. If we expect, and there's good reason to expect, uh, that the marginal propensity to, to save at the top end is at least positive and probably increasing, then income increases at the top necessarily produced increased savings, increased savings in aggregate for the economy as a whole. Now, macroeconomic balance requires that real ex incomes should equal real expenditures in aggregate. So if people at the top are abstaining from consumption, their annual flow of consumption is less than their annual flow of income, then somebody somewhere elsewhere in the system has to be acquiring has to be spending in excess of their income. There has to be some excess spending somewhere else in the system if the savings of the, uh, of the top end are to balance in the system as a whole. So, of course, when the people at the top end save, they typically save not in, in real physical terms, but in, ter in financial terms, by acquiring financial assets. Well, a financial asset ha has a two-faced characteristic. A financial asset uh, to, to the owner is an asset. A financial instrument to the owner is, is an asset. To the issuer, it's a, it's a liability. The flip side of increasing wealth at the top end of the income distribution is increasing liabilities in the bottom end of the distribution. Now. Bob Frank also has a whole set of arguments about how consumption norms escalate when inequality uh, increases, when the 
when you have these high compounding rates of growth of income at the top end, uh, and, and suddenly it's, it's not enough uh, to, to have a, a granite countertop in, in your kitchen. You've got to have the granite countertops in, in both your bathrooms. And of course, it's not enough just to have two bathrooms. You've got to have ensuite bathrooms and, uh, and, and mudrooms and, and every other thing. That, he has a, a, quite a nice argument about how norms at the top have set up these expenditure cascades of, of consumption norms. And in particular, uh, when so much of the wealth of the middle class is concentrated in, in home equity, and then particularly in the U.S. could be monetized uh, for, for consumption, how this sets off expenditure ca ca cascades throughout the in income distribution. You don't actually need that argument to, to make the, the point that the increasing assets of the top 1% have to have their converse in the increasing liabilities of the bottom 99%. Some people have argued that there's been an inc the increase in inequality of consumption in the long term in, in, the, in the U.S. particularly has been less than the increase in inequality uh, of income. Uh, that, that people's, uh, and there's a, 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 a debate about that. If true, the flip side has not really been recognized. That if people's consumption is growing less unequal than their incomes, something must be happening to the distribution of assets and liabilities. Because you can only change your consumption less than your income if you're acquiring assets or issuing liabilities. So the flip side of differential growth rates and the increasing acquisition of financial assets at the top is increasing financial liabilities and increasing debt leverage. And uh, that's a process that as debts mount, and we've seen, we're seeing this process in Canada, uh, as financial debts mount, but money incomes remain stagnant, that leverage cannot increase without limits. At some point, uh, the house of cards comes crashing down. Financial crises don't just stop there. They generate real income real economy recessions. Within real e the real economy, of course, governments, partly because of automatic stabilizers of the system and partly from discretionary counter-cyclical uh, fiscal policies, uh, step in. So we start to see the power of accounting identities. The idea that your debt in period T is just one plus the average interest rate times your debt in the previous period, uh, minus the amount you get to pay back. PB could stand for either primary balance of government or pay back. It's convenient. Uh, it, it's just an accounting identity. D divide by uh, income, take the difference. Uh, and when you get the second equation, that the change in the debt to income ratio depends on the difference between the interest rate and the growth rate multiplied by the debt to income ratio of the previous period minus the fraction you get to the primary balance. I think it's a very useful uh, a, a couple of accounting identities, uh, not just relevant to the public sector, relevant to any, uh, to corporations, to, to households, uh, just an accounting identity. But what it Im implies is that if the interest rate, if debts are, com are compounding over time, then you become uniquely vulnerable to the difference between interest rates and growth rates. We saw that in action in a big way in Canada in the, in the mid-1990s, in the late 80s, early 90s, when est interest rates escalated. It wasn't because of a, a growth in the primary balance uh, that Canadian governments got into such problems in the early 1990s it was because interest rates, the gap between interest rates and growth rates grew quite dramatically. So the, the debt was compounding at a much faster rate than income was growing. And if we're ever going to uh, put, a, put a break on inflation, then that's good. 
that's the way that it's going to happen again. Central banks do that. They raise interest rates in order to decrease the growth rate. Well, okay, what's the option then if you have a, 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 a fiscal crisis, uh, sorry, if we have a financial crisis uh, and a collapse in the, in the real economy, escalating uh, expenditures and declining receipts, so the primary balance is increasing and debts are, are mounting. Uh, we can monetize that debt by, uh, that's another word for quantitative easing actually, uh, buy, buy it up with cash. Uh, if we do that, we keep on doing that? Uh, at, at what point uh, do, we, do we stop uh, just printing money to to, to cover government debts. On the other hand, the U.S. Uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio has gone up by like 50 percentage points uh, between 2004 and 2012 and is still increasing and heading from the roof. At current, uh, at current levels, uh, maintaining a primary balance uh, with return to traditional interest rates requires like 2.4% of GDP. Uh, that, that expenditures be, the primary balance be like 2%, 0.4% of GDP. What's the point? The point is that we have escalating and interacting instabilities. That the, the, the financial crisis produces real crises. The real crises produce crises of public finance. The crises of public finance have to be, uh, in, in the short term, produce uh, counter-cyclical fiscal flows which compound into debt stocks which down the road uh, create new problems of, for the current fiscal uh, um, public balance and for any sort of future fiscal policy or monetary policy. So the long-term po policy the outlook therefore is for interacting instabilities but Mexico is a very different case. What we have here is the growth incidence curve for Mexico, which looks at the percentiles of the income distribution and the growth rate uh, between 1994 and 2006 in, in incomes at different points in the income distribution. And what you'll see is that growth rate was much higher at the bottom part of the income distribution than at the top. So you don't have this tendency for financial fragility if incomes are growing strongly at the bottom of the income distribution. And why? Because in Mexico, we had a whole series of what you can call structural changes, what other people would call one-time changes. Now, it started in 1995 from an underemployment uh, re recession situation. Part of the growth is a recovery, a cyclical recovery. But in addition, there are a lot of structural changes happening in Mexico over the last 30 odd years, which are not so different from the structural changes that Canada and the US went through earlier. If you've got a high percentage of the population engaged in agriculture, you can have a lot of people moving out of rural poverty into the ur urban sector. Now, sometimes they move, move into informal urban employment and then later into in formal urban employment, but either way, it's a big increase in family incomes. If you've got a low percentage of women employed in the paid labor market, increasing female labor force participation makes a huge difference to household incomes. The process has already been going on for, for decades in Canada, just starting uh, in Relatively low edu levels of educational attainment in Mexico, meaning you've got very high marginal returns to human capital and lots of people who can benefit from increasing education. We talk all the time in Canada about the importance of education, but we're already a very well-educated society, particularly for younger cohorts. So we're talking about marginal gains for a relatively small percentage of the now, in the Mexican case, capital deepening is also part of the story. That was also true in Canada and the U.S. post-war. And 
we had a, in Canada and the US, we also had the a demographic uh, surge. Mexico has had that again in the last 30, 30 odd years. Again, once you've got very low birth rates, not much room left to change. In addition to which, the political economy of social policy has got to be important. Mexico has a large and long and very violent history of civil conflict. Canada, I looked up the numbers on the, on, we have like, uh, like, uh, like four incidents that I can think of. Uh, there was the Real, uh, uh, the 1837 Lower Upper Lower Canada rebellions, the, the Real rebellions of the 1880s. Uh, in, in Western Canada, we, we had a pit, Winnipeg general uh, strike uh, and a total of, uh, and then there's Quebec secessionary events. I, something like seven people killed in the, in the whole history of, uh, of Quebec independence movements. Uh, a couple in, in Winnipeg. The big killer was back in the 1837. So our Canada's two century death toll in civil conflict is significantly less than the ep than estimates of the number of people who got killed in the, the main plaza in Mexico City in 1968 in the, in the uh, demonstrations about the uh, Mexican Olympics. Right? The contrasts in sort of the, the, the blood quotient of, uh, of history uh, are, are, are just tr uh, truly dramatic. My point is that the Mexican elite have good reason to worry about the potential for extra constitutional change. And 1995 happened to be the, the year of the Chiapas uh, rebellion in the south of Mexico. So there was a credible hard left political uh, threat effect that you could argue for. And, and, the, and, the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the and the Mexican elite responded. Uh, the, the decline of the PRI in Mexico was matched with the expansion of substantial social programs, the Progressive Program, which has had a significant impact on, in, in, on the incomes of the bottom 20-25% of the population. By contrast, what's been happening in Canada, uh, about the same time, we saw the impact of the debt stability equation. Uh, we saw that we had the fiscal crisis of the early 1990s, and in Canada's a country where uh, a majority covering has a lot of room for maneuver. And in 1995, uh, well, this, this plots, the top line is the change in the Gini index for of household disposable equivalent income from, from taxes compared to the, the Gini index of household disposable income market income. The green line is the impact on the change in the Gini index comparing household disposable money income before taxes, uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, household disposable money income and the impact of transfers. So the top line measures the inequality reducing impact of taxes. The bottom line, the, the middle line re re uh, is the impact on inequality of transfers and the bottom dark, dashed uh, black line is the impact of taxes plus the impact of transfers or the net impact of government total. Uh, and so the, the point of putting it up is to, to note that the, the impact of taxes on the distribution of income, uh, it's there uh, on, any, on income, any quality of the distribution of income. It's, it's there, uh, it has a little bit of a trend in it, but, but not much over this period. Uh, where we've seen, where we saw action, uh, was in the changing role of, the, of transfer, the Canadian transfer system. Uh, it used to be that you would go to international conferences and you say, "Oh, you're from Canada." Uh, the big, incre big increase in market income inequality, but you guys have stabilized it all right. Uh, the, 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 the Canadian tax transfer mechanism uh, worked to, to stabilize the distribution of after-tax after-transfer income up until about 1995. The impact of the Martin cuts uh, in 1995 was to change that transfer uh, component of, of, of the system and to change it to, instead of offsetting, to ac more accentuating the increase in inequality that's coming from increased market income inequality. So the bottom line it represents the change in sort of 
inequality stance, if you will, of, of the Canadian fiscal system. Up to 1995, working against the tide of increasing inequality, since 1995, if anything, increase, uh, working to accentuate it and stabilizing a bit in the 2000s. So, we haven't seen an, Im an attempt of Canadian governments uh, to uh, try to stabilize the distribution of income in Canada. We could, uh, majority governments can change directions, uh, but I'd, I'd argue that we, we don't see it. I don't see any particular likelihood uh, for state and Canada to, st to start thinking about recycling incomes uh, at any, any, any time soon. Um, we've had in, in Canada for oh, since the early 70s uh, a, a national narrative of, about being the kinder and gentler uh, part of the uh, North American continent. But that's uh, that's just a, a national myth of, of relatively recent origin. Uh, I mean, the U.S. got Social Security back in the 1930s. We had to wait up to the early 1970s uh, to get Canada pension plan. Uh, so the, 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 lo the longer historical trajectory of, of Canada is more like the colder and harder uh, part of the continent. Uh, there, there's no history of hard left uh, threat. Uh, there's no threat effect on, on, on elites. Uh, and currently, the, the, the current political scene uh, certainly sees a conservative majority with, I would argue, as close to zero, absolute zero concern with increasing inequality as is possible to measure. Uh, the, the, both in their public pronouncements about, or lack of public, any mention of, uh, the, the trend and in, the, in their philosophical opposition to anything that could reverse that trend. Um, I can't see any chances for, for uh, no, I'd say no near-term prospect of a political economy of redistribution and, and stabilization. So that kind of leaves the, the US. And, and, and the question is, what are the chances for a new New Deal? Uh, back in the 1930s, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, kind of saved capitalism from itself. Uh, he stabilized, there a lot of people have focused for a long time on the public works component uh, of, of the New Deal and have ignored the, the, the many other structural reforms that were part of that whole policy package. There was a policy, part of the policy package was to, to get unions uh, into the tent uh, to, to uh, re recognize collective bargaining and to encourage collective bargaining, which gave a voice uh, to, to the bottom part of the income distribution. American union density was greater than can Canadians well into the 1950s. Um, there's also Structural reforms like bank uh, regulation, uh, increase in social securities, a progressive tax system, a whole bunch of mechanisms which, one way and another, tended to improve the growth chances of the bottom end of the income distribution and to recycle income uh, uh, from, from, from the top. And that, you could argue, stabilized uh, growth in the, or certainly stabilized growth of different part, parts of the distribution uh, for the best part of 50 years. It only really got systematically started to be dismantled in the 1980s. And in particular, we've seen a dramatic decline in top marginal income tax rates uh, and a decrease in income recycling from, from the top. Currently, uh, I'd argue that there are two really big things going on, kind of conflicted attitudes uh, to inequality in the U.S. and the impact of, of money politics. Um, so so the, the little graph there is taken from an, author, an article with uh, Tim Smeeting uh, where we looked at the attitudes of people in, Canada, in the U.S. and a bunch of other countries uh, to what people should earn and what they do earn. Uh, and if you're satisfied with the distribution of income, you'll say that most of the time what people do earn is what they should earn. The ratio between those is one. Uh, most, almost every other country, there's kind of a unimodal distribution and it's significantly less than one. Most people, most every part of the world, would like there to be more equality. Uh, and there's, there's, it's, there's a variation in attitudes, but there's kind of a 
common consensus. What you, what the U.S. distribution of attitudes is notable for is it's a bimodal character. Uh, a bunch of people quite satisfied with things as they are, uh, uh, and a very strong group of people very dissatisfied with the things as they are. Now, a bimodal distribution has the characteristic that it's a bit unstable, that if you shift a few people from one mode to the other, then the majority can tip one way or the other. Uh, but on the other hand, the U.S. has this system of balance of powers with uh, dual houses elected on differing terms of the important roles of court decisions. If you can block change for long enough, you can hope that the, the balance of power will and of course, we've seen since the Supreme Court decision in the U.S. a few years ago uh, that you can basically buy whatever you want in terms of uh, political ads, uh, that those who have, have billions can spend hundreds of millions uh, to, to get the sort of political change or get the political wind uh, that they want. So the stronger economic uh, political economy feedback mode uh, feedback loop uh, may well be the idea that increasing economic inequality breeds increasing political inequality uh, through, through the campaign contribution. So my story up to now isn't really a very happy story. It's a story about uh, uh, how we've had this very fundamental dis disconnect between growth rates at the very top and growth rates for the vast majority of, of the population. Now there isn't that I can see any automatic economic tendency for those growth rates to equalize anytime soon. There may have been his happy historical accidents in the past when stru one-time structural changes produced strong growth rates at the bottom in Canada and the US, but we shouldn't mistake those happy historical periods uh, for the f what, what we can expect uh, going forward because they're one-off uh, kind of structural changes. And I don't see any automatic economic tendency for growth rates to equalize at different points in the income distribution. I think that political economy is crucial. Now, of course, one thing that we know is that the unsustainable can't get to sustain. It doesn't last. What isn't so clear is what follows. Unbalanced income growth does necessarily imply ever-increasing inequality. And that can't be a steady state equilibrium. I'm arguing that it has multiple instability implications because increasing income inequality necessarily implies changes in consumption and savings flows, which necessarily compound into changing distributions of assets and liabilities at different points in income distribution. <coughs> now, Ask the question, what are the chances for a new New Deal? And comparing ourselves with the 1930s, well, we know the world has changed in many, many, many dramatic ways. But one thing that uh, I think is remains true, uh, that the political economy of adaptation to systemic st instability doesn't have just one answer. In the, 19, in the Europe of the 1930s, we saw the playing out of, political, of many political changes in response to great economic inst instabilities. <coughs> Some nations made political choices that were disastrous, for both for themselves and for many, uh, many millions of people, of Germany, of Italy, uh, of Spain. Some uh, countries made political choices uh, which have generated in, enduring success stories. I'd count those as the Scandinavian social democracies. <coughs> so my bottom line is that political choices matter. 